The Rise of Soviet Communism, Tsarism to the Bolsheviks. This is Tsar Nicholas II of Russia in 1912. He's the man who would lose to the Bolsheviks, the communists, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin. Uh, and he would be killed along with his entire family when they were assassinated in a basement in Yekaterinburg uh, once the Soviet Revolution was uh, won or was well underway by the communists. World War I is really what does in Tsar Nicholas II. Um, before the war, he was already in trouble. The war is what shattered his legitimacy. Legitimacy is the popular belief amongst the citizens or subjects of a state that the ruler is effective, legally justified, and worth obeying. So if you have a legitimate ruler, the people, whether they like him or not, or whether their lives are going on uh, well enough or not, will generally go along. People don't like a lot of change. Uh, but if a, lead a leader loses their legitimacy, they are in a lot of trouble. And Tsar Nicholas II, by the time World War I had broken out, had already lost much of his legitimacy. Uh, one, he had been responsible for the disastrous uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which we talked about in the last unit, which brought the Japanese into uh, the world stage and made Russia look foolish. And there had also been, after that, a uh, series of protests that took place in Petrograd or in uh, St. Petersburg, where the uh where protesters demanding you know a better government and a end to a government that would lose wars uh protested and demanded food and better jobs and all other stuff and they were fired upon by the czar's troops uh in what became to be known as bloody sunday that obviously doesn't help your legitimacy his family also became closely related to a Orthodox faith healer, who I'll show you in the next slide, named Grigory Rasputin, who kind of creeped everybody in the country out. Uh, Tsar Nicholas's mismanagement of the economy was, was terrible. Um, this was a time of the Industrial Revolution and all kinds of successes, and uh, monarchical czarism wasn't great for making you know, your average person happy and wealthy. And um, in general, Tsar Nicholas had refused any kind of like democratic reforms, any kind of move towards being a constitutional monarchy. And so the Duma, which is the name for the Russian legislature, he had constantly kind of brought into place and then decided to get rid of or ignored. And so there was just a real frustration throughout the country with Tsar Nicholas II, even before World War I. And then once World War I broke out, because World War, uh, the Russians were so wildly unprepared for it technologically in terms of their rail system and basically every way you can possibly imagine, uh, the Russians did extremely poorly. And that was clearly the responsibility of Tsar Nicholas II. This is Rasputin, Grigory Rasputin, the guy who became the faith healer for the uh, family of uh, Tsar Nicholas. And as you can see, he's a creepy looking dude. And he was um, a very odd figure, uh, not liked within the Orthodox Church itself, which saw him as a charlatan or a fake um, and also a, a sexual predator and various other things. So he was a really uh, bad guy. Um, he was, however, strangely able to help out the Tsarevich or the son of the uh, Tsar and his wife, uh, who was a hemophiliac. And for some reason or another, uh, Grigory Rasputin was capable of keeping that kid alive uh, in a time when, when it was difficult to treat he uh, hemophilia. And so uh, particularly the Tsar's wife became fixated on this gentleman. And that led uh, a lot of people within uh, the Russian elites and the Russian popular uh, you know, opinion to really hate Tsar Nicholas and feel like, as you can see in this cartoon here, Rasputin was secretly controlling the royal family. And that obviously isn't going to help your legitimacy uh, if you're trying to uh, do well, especially if you're away at the front trying to lead the armies, which Nicholas was, or uh, which Nicholas was, and his wife was back at home hanging out with, you know, creepy looking dude here. So as a result of the war and Nicholas's previous bad actions and a little bit of Rasputin in there for some flavor, uh, in 1917 in February, there was the Russian Revolution or the first stage of the Russian Revolution. There's kind of two revolutions in 1917. Um, by February 1917, the Russian army was just collapsing. Russian troops had been pushed very deeply into Russia by the Germans. Um, they had faced huge troop losses. The economy was collapsing, as you would imagine would happen in a losing war. And so in February of 1917, the Duma, or the legislature of Russia, uh, finally declared itself the provisional government, which meant that they just said, like, we're now in charge. So it was a coup. It was a nonviolent coup, a seizure of state by the Duma, just 
taking power. Um, and they began to run things or try to run things and to decide what to do about Tsar Nicholas II. And Tsar Nicholas II was left at the front leading troops, uh, but back at home, theoretically, he was no longer in charge. So it was kind of a fluid situation where nobody was really sure who was running Russia exactly. The Duma was, but the army was still very in favor, at least the generals were, of Tsar Nicholas II. At the same time, there were a lot of communists um, who were popular throughout Europe at this point, but who were particularly in Russia, quite popular in the big cities and the big factories. Pretty much nowhere else in Russia, however, were they popular. Peasants in Russia couldn't have cared less about the communists if they even knew about them. Uh, but in the big cities, and particularly the crucial big cities of Moscow and Petrograd or St. Petersburg, the uh, Soviets and the communists were quite powerful and they controlled the factories and so that meant that they were the people in charge of like making the guns for the war and all this other stuff and uh, that gave the soviets a huge influence because if the working class decided to go on strike the war would fail and so the soviets became increasingly powerful um, the duma itself um, once it did become the government tried to figure out like how do we get out of this war which became something they couldn't actually figure out how to do um, the allies their, their French and British allies desperately wanted them in the war and leaned on them very heavily to stay in the war because they needed the Germans distracted so that they could hopefully beat the Germans. And so Russia and the Duma found it almost impossible to leave World War I, which of course was the thing that had to happen if Russia was going to recover and avoid some kind of communist takeover, which it did not. The man who kind of could have perhaps avoided the Russian Revolution and who did not um, was a kind of center-left figure uh, in the Russian sense named Alexander Kerensky, and he kind of became the crucial man in the middle in the Russian Revolution, the first stage of it. So he was a communist. Uh, he was what's called a Menshevik communist, which meant that he was less radical than Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky, the Bolshevik communists. And he still was a communist, though, like no question. Um, and very importantly, however, uh, Kerensky was one of the few communists who had been elected to the Duma. And so he was kind of crucial because he was in the Petrograd Soviet, the communist government of St. Petersburg or Petrograd. And he was also in the Duma, which meant that he could kind of speak to everyone uh, who had power at the time. And so he became uh, in charge of Russia and tried to figure out like, how to thread the needle of creating a, a, a revolution and one that was a communist revolution, but one that would not be the kind of vicious communist revolution of the Bolsheviks. He desperately wanted to get out of the war, uh, but he was kind of caught in between the problem that the Germans were making these incredibly uh, hard demands because there was no Russian army really capable of opposing them. And so the Germans figured, let's get everything we can, which one would do. Um, the problem was for Kerensky, had he agreed to those demands, it would have been and so humiliating that it would have destroyed his power anyway, so he couldn't really do that. And then the Allies, the French, the, Germ uh, the French, the British, the United States, really wanted him to stay in the war and made some severe threats about what would happen to Russia if um, they did leave the war because the Allies needed the Russians in the war. So that kind of put Kerensky in a, in a terrible situation. And then you had the Bolsheviks, the far more left-wing, dictatorial, uh, vanguard party uh, uh, led by Lenin, Trotsky, uh, and eventually Stalin, who were constantly undermining Kerensky, uh, trying to organize the Soviets, uh, the workers' councils throughout the big cities of Russia, and basically preparing for a second coup to seize power because they felt that Kerensky was not communist enough. And so at the same time, you also had the economy falling apart because there's losing a war, troops are completely confused about who he's, who's even in charge and they're losing the war so they begin to desert. The army just kind of begins to fall apart. Uh, at the same time, the communists, particularly the Bolshevik communists, uh, begin to infiltrate the army. They're the only people joining the army and the army needs men, so they take them even though they know they're communists, which very quickly puts the communists in charge of a very significant amount of military force. And the communists also control the railroads because that's a working class job, obviously, and most of those people were communists, which meant that Lenin and Trotsky could order around uh, railroads, which is gonna be crucial later on. And then you had Tsar Nicholas and the generals around him who were still off at the front with an army, and they were thinking that the best thing they could do would be to uh, seize power militarily themselves. So basically, Kerensky is trapped between a whole series of people who really want uh, some kind of Russia other than the one he wants to make, and he can't even make the one he wants to make.
This is Alexander Kerensky himself looking not too cheerful for obvious reasons. And you can see how far into uh, Russia the Germans had pushed and how far they would eventually get as a treaty here uh, when the Russians do finally quit the war. And so in October 1917, the actual communist revolution that we think of as the key one happens, the, the final one, I suppose, October Revolution of 1917. So in Petrograd, the Soviets, uh, the workers' councils, were effectively in charge of that whole city, which was the capital of Russia. Uh, there were also huge powers in Moscow. And things were just falling apart. Bread rioting, uncontrolled uh, economic collapse. Things were very bad for Kerensky and for Russia. Uh, Germany at that point decides that they will take Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and transport him from Switzerland where he was staying across Germany into Finland and then basically just drop him off in Russia. He was kind of like a little biological weapon that the Germans hoped that Lenin would be able to create a revolution that would take down Kerensky and take down the Russian government and knock Russia out of the war, which worked. Uh, so in some ways, the Germans' willingness to use Lenin as a pawn does make it... Uh, possible for them to knock the Russians out of the war and gave them some chance, although not much, of winning World War I, which they do lose. Um, the Russian military um, also at the same moment threatens an immediate coup. Uh, basically, they finally had their act together and they were ready to try and take the government back for the Tsar. And the only thing that really does stop them, however, is Bolshevik control of the rail lines so that the uh, and also Bolshevik infiltration of the Russian military so that the generals are not even capable of getting their troops to Petrograd to take over. And Kerensky at that point realizes that he is not in charge, that even though he's theoretically the ruler of Russia, the real power lies in the hands of the Bolsheviks through the Soviets control of the railroad and things like that. And then on October 25th and 26th, um, the Bolsheviks proceed to seize power in Petrograd and take over the government. And they basically just do a massive show of force and uh, Bolshevik communist people take over Petrograd and thus begin to take over all of Russia. So here's a nice little image of Lenin here on the left, um, who is addressing the crowds and, you know, looking all heroic and stuff like that. So that's uh, Lenin. Uh, and you can see the red flag of communism. Entertainingly, on the right side of this, you'll see a bronze statue, one of the last giant bronze statues of Lenin that's in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle, where I live, um, which was uh, bought at a yard sale, as I understand, or a kind of auction in Lithuania, I think, before it was going to be trashed. Uh, and then, strangely, is like in the middle of Fremont as kind of a joke statue. People often paint the hands red because he's a bloody dictator. Um, and uh, the naked bike riders of the Seattle Solstice Parade also ride by him, which uh, pretty sure Lenin would have hated. So I, I kind of enjoy that part of it. So this is the big three of the Bolshevik Revolution. In the middle, you see the, the heart and soul of the revolution, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, whose revolutionary name was Lenin, which is what he's usually known by. You can see him with the papers there in his hand, proving him to be an intellectual and a thoughtful man. On the left is the guy who will win everything at the end. This is Joseph Stalin, who will become the dictator of the Soviet Union after the death of Lenin. On the right is Leon Trotsky, who was the kind of organizational and military genius of the early revolution, who would eventually be chased out of the country by Stalin and assassinated. So once the Bolsheviks do seize power, they had a real problem creating a communist state in the middle of a war with a collapsed economy and a whole lot of enemies. So immediately they have to figure out like how to get out of the war. They cut a deal with the Germans um, to basically just abandon the war with horrible losses. Um, and that is a, a problem that they're going to face. They also um, immediately decide that they can win uh, an election. Uh, the Bolsheviks, particularly Lenin and Trotsky, believed that they were way more popular than they were. They did not understand that the peasants didn't care for them or didn't even know who they were. Um, and they also failed to understand that a lot of Soviet working people, proletarians, factory people, would really have preferred Kerensky to the Bolsheviks under uh, Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. And so when the Bolsheviks do uh, call for these national elections, they don't really have in place a good way to fix the elections because they were only in control of a couple of cities. And so when the elections do happen, and they're not the world's greatest elections, but they are elections and not unreasonable ones, um, the Mensheviks weirdly do very well, um, enough to put Kerensky back in power had the elections been uh, listened to. But instead, Lenin, Trotsky, and the rest of the Bolsheviks simply say, like, we don't care, we're going to invalidate the elections, and they proceed to create a communist dictatorship.
leadership of the proletariat, which sparks an enormous civil war right in the middle of the actual World War I. So everything gets very chaotic, incredibly violent during this period. And here's a map of the Civil War. You can see the Soviets kind of controlled, or the Bolsheviks controlled the center of Russia, including the key cities here. And there are invasions by Allied troops, French and British people, the Americans, uh, various other forces. And then you have various Russian forces also fighting. The Soviets, however, the Bolsheviks will win this fight. The Civil War itself was incredibly violent and brutal on top of a war that was already violent and brutal. And it was also very confusing. You have the Reds, which are the Bolshevik communists. You have the Whites, which is everybody who's Russian who's not them. And then you also had foreigners involved in the Russian Civil War. Lenin and Trotsky, as I said, cut an immediate peace deal with the Germans, basically saying, we'll give you anything you want. So the Germans make some crazy demands. On the other hand, the Germans are leaving anyway because they're about to lose World War I. So uh, Trotsky and, and Lenin figure, you know, we'll cut any treaty because we're going to get all this land back anyway, which is true, uh, most, most, mostly. Um, and because the uh, Bolsheviks are in the center of everything, they control Moscow, Petrograd, a lot of the other big cities, and they control the rail system, they're kind of in a good position because they can fight you know, pretty quickly because it's always easier to have interior lines or be at the center and you can pick off one or another allies uh, or enemies as you go along. And then the white forces who oppose them, the Russian whites, uh, were uh you know based on the idea of a whole series of like mensheviks who were mad about losing power you had standard democratic types who wanted a constitutional monarchy or an actual democracy uh you had ethnic national separatists such as ukrainians and various people seeking to create their own nations um and then you had uh monarchists people who wanted to put nicholas ii back in power uh, since all these people had totally different goals, they don't cooperate, and that makes things pretty easy on uh, Trotsky, particularly, who is running the Red Army or the uh, Soviet forces. The, the interesting thing is, and most people don't know, that the United States, France, and Great Britain all invaded Russia on the side of the whites at this point, and um, that was... Uh, not a good thing for later history, obviously, because it made the Russians very paranoid, uh, particularly the communists very paranoid, and it didn't really do much. It was kind of a sideshow. People were very tired after World War One, and there was no way that the French, British, and the Americans were actually going to do enough uh, because everybody just wanted World War One to be over, because by this point it was. And so the communists do end up winning. The Bolsheviks do end up winning. Trotsky turns out to be a very efficient, efficient manager and uh, knows how to choose good generals. And the Red Army, which becomes the center of communist uh, Bolshevik power, uh, is formed in fire at this point, basically, and becomes capable of defeating its enemies and holding on to power. Uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, uh, comes into being. And because it had to defeat all these people, it comes into power with a lot of prestige. People beforehand who didn't like it uh, now understood that, you know, these guys were serious and they were tough. And that kind of prestige does help. It gives you legitimacy. Um, Germany had been defeated in World War I, and so that allowed the, the Soviets to get back parts of uh, the territory they had bargained away. Although, very importantly, not Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and a few other territories. But the losses that Stalin and Trotsky had agreed to end up not being as severe as they had been originally. And then the United States and France and the United Kingdom invading Russia weirdly turned uh, Lenin, who was a communist internationalist into a national hero uh, and gives the Bolsheviks a kind of nationalist credibility that they wouldn't have had before. Um, normally communists oppose the nation state, but somehow because of these civil wars and the foreign invasions, Lenin ended up looking like a Russian national hero, uh, which is definitely not how he started the whole business. And the Bolsheviks then had to figure out like, how do we create actual communism? And that would take them quite a while and um, have very mediocre success at best. And so through the 1920s, Lenin would find himself in control. You can see him here saying, follow the path, comrades. And so he turned from a wartime leader into a kind of economic figure, promising land, bread, and peace, and uh, to, from each according to his ability, to each according to his own, the classic dreams of communism, all people equal, receiving what they needed. Although in practice, it didn't work very well. Because of his leadership in the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War, Lenin ends up uh, being in the minds of at least Soviet communists, 
on equal par with Marx and Friedrich Engels, the founders, the original founders of communism. So you get now what is called Leninist communism, a uh, particularly Russian version of communism. And Lenin is seen by the Russian communists as kind of the architect of the revolution. You can see here the rail lines that connected uh, Russia, which was high tech at the day, although not so much today. Um, and you can see him like staring at his creation, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And he's also looking to the West. And so there's clearly an eye on Western Europe where Lenin hoped to spread communism, as would later Stalin. Um, when he took over after Lenin has a stroke and uh, dies and Trotsky flees the country to avoid assassination by Stalin and he will later be ex assassinated in Mexico City. So uh, that is the setup of the Soviet communist state, which you'll study for the rest of the unit.